Shalom to one and all. On behalf of the International March of the Living, I welcome you to today's webinar. My name is Monice Newman and I serve as the National Consultant for the International March of the Living. I feel very honored to introduce both John Keane, a renowned director and producer, and Rich Brownstein. After a career in Hollywood, Rich Brownstein has become a leading international expert concerning the history and use of Holocaust films. He has lectured for the Yad Vashem International School for Holocaust Studies in Jerusalem since 2014, specializing in the use of Holocaust film history and pedagogy. He is the author of The Holocaust Cinema Complete, a history and analysis of 400 films that is accompanied with a teaching guide. John has been involved in the documentary film world as a director and producer since the release of his feature film, Swimming in Auschwitz, in 2007. Prior to that, John worked in the narrative film industry as a writer and a director. In April of 2018, John released the documentary, After Auschwitz, chronicling the lives of the same six women from Swimming in Auschwitz, but beginning on the day of liberation and focusing on the most common question audiences ask of survivors. What did you do next? After Auschwitz, released by Passion River Films and AMC Independent, played theatrically in over 40 cities across the United States and internationally, and garnered a perfect 100% score on the review website Rotten Tomatoes as well as inclusion on various best of 2018 film lists. Other projects in development include an untitled Rwandan documentary, which focuses on the state of the country 25 years after genocide in partnership with the USC Shoah Foundation. When not working on film projects, John is serving his second term as an elected member of the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board of Education in California. Since its inception in 1988, the International March of the Living has brought over 275,000 students and adults, both Jewish and non-Jewish, from over 40 countries around the globe, to Poland on Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day, and Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzvaot in Israel, Israel's Memorial Day and Israel Independence Day. The work of the International March has had a tremendous impact on its participants and its supporters, and has served as a call to action for our thousands of alumni to do their part to fight for a future free of anti-Semitism, racism, hatred, and intolerance in all its form. While we continue to navigate this new world we find ourselves in, the International March of the Living remains determined to continue to educate the world about the horrors of the past in order to ensure a better future. I ask that you please put your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer them after the presentation. It is with much pleasure that I now turn the webinar to John Keane and Rich Brownstein. Thank you both. Great, thank you so much, Monice. It's really a pleasure to be, uh, to be involved with any event sponsored by March of the Living, which is such a wonderful organization. And thank you, Moniz, for your, your, your tireless work on its behalf and, and, and your people helping today. Um, I am so excited to be here with Rich. <laughs> it's, we, it, it's almost like he's a brother from another mother. We both have a passion for Holocaust cinema. Um, as someone with a Google alert for the word Auschwitz, um, I start daily reading about this. And when I read about his book, I was just so excited. I got it from Amazon. Sadly, it sat in my book queue for a little while, but when I, once I started reading it, I encourage all of you right now, before we even get into the Q&A, go on Amazon right now and buy it, Holocaust Cinema Complete. It is a scholarly book, which is exceedingly accessible at the same time. And that's a gift to Rich and his ability to crystallize the material. So I am super excited to have some time to talk with Rich and to get questions, but I think it'd be best to let, let him take it away right now present some of uh, his overview and criteria for how he came to this book, how he defines Holocaust cinema. We'll have some back and forth and then we'll get some questions from the Q&A that people put in. So I'm so happy to introduce Rich Brownstein who will talk to us about Holocaust cinema. Rich. Thank you, 
Oh, and I, we were, well, no, I didn't have to say well, it. I didn't have to say it. <laughs> well, thank you, my brother from another mother. That is uh, quite an introduction, and I'm very flattered. And uh, I'm really honored to be speaking for the International March of the Living, uh, their great work, and Phyllis Heidemann and, and everybody that, that's involved. Uh, I um, taught seminars to uh, some of their staff at Yad Vashem, and um, their work is, is uh, indispensable. Uh, so I'm going to provide a brief overview, a slideshow, and then we're going to, um, and then John's going to take it, and um, we'll go from there. Uh, so the, uh, let's see here. There we go. So um, the first question that people ask is, what is a narrative Holocaust film? So narrative films, as opposed to what John makes, which are documentaries, are stories portrayed by actors. Let's start there. In addition, for me to uh, classify something as a Holocaust film, it's going to be either a feature or a made for television movie. I don't include documentaries, shorts, or miniseries. Miniseries, if they were only two parts, I do, but uh, not things like War and Remembrance or Holocaust, uh, although they have cultural importance. Uh, narrative, uh, to, to, to be a Holocaust film, it has to have significant Holocaust content or themes. Since 1945, there have been uh, approximately 450 narrative Holocaust films and television programs made. Um, and uh, which seems like a lot, but it's only six a year. And that's worldwide. That's 45 countries. In fact, you can see here uh, that Holocaust uh, film production has increased. Uh, there, there was a time that very few were made and now they come out very, very often. Uh, and this is a breakdown by country. And you'll notice that America has only made a quarter of all the Holocaust films and Germany has made about a quarter of them. Uh, but there's a great representation, international representation. Some countries uh, like China and Spain um, have made films that, that really, uh, and Macedonia about their specific involvement in the, in the Holocaust, like in Shanghai. Holocaust films, surprisingly, have shown the greatest variety of filmmaking of any genre of film, uh, in, as this slide shows, in feature films, in comedies, and farces, and streaming media, episodic. So uh, the, people have been experimenting with Holocaust cinema uh, and sometimes they, they make it and sometimes they don't, but they're always trying. And so very rarely are you going to see something that is really the first time it's ever been tried. Uh, Jojo Rabbit was not the first comedy uh, farce. And um, uh, there, have, there have been shorts that have been great. But the reason that most people think that there have been so many Holocaust films is because uh, of the 77 American produced Holocaust related films, 21 have been nominated for at least one Oscar, which is an outrageously high hit rate uh, of, of over a quarter. Uh, and more than that, uh, from 1960 through 2015, on average, every other year a foreign language film has been nominated that that's holocaust related has been nominated for an oscar so it seems like there are more than uh have th th than there are and the reasons for this attention at the oscars is a much broader question uh but it is by far the most celebrated genre of film these are some some example the, this is the entire list of 
uh, Holocaust films that have uh, won or been nominated for at least one Oscar, excluding the foreign language films, which will be on the next slide. Uh, I want you to read them all carefully because there'll be a quiz afterwards. I'm kidding, there won't be. All right, I'm now moving to the next one. Ready? Here we go. And uh, you'll recognize many of these films. <clears throat> Holocaust film production, though, actually breaks down, I break it down into four eras. Just after the war until through 1973, uh, they were films that, that didn't deal so directly with the Holocaust, with the exception of uh, The Pawnbroker. But uh, during that period, you have George Stevens' The Diary of Anne Frank, which uh, went out of its way to really shield the audience from uh, actual Holocaust horrors. Then starting uh, in 1974, you have a lot of television production um, and it's really the, the most uh, financially lucrative uh, part of, of Holocaust production, where you had the Holocaust miniseries in 1978 uh, on NBC and Schindler's List, uh, which were the two uh, greatest, uh, uh, financially greatest accomplishments in Holocaust film and culturally impactful. Uh, regardless of the quality of, of them as films or as art, they were the most impactful. Then we get to the mature era where really the greatest Holocaust films are made from 1997 through 2013. And um, uh, in my list of recommended films, there, there are many, many that are from that period. And finally, we're in the consolidated era where yes, many films are being made but half of all the films that are coming out now are remakes of previous films, which I should say on the whole are better than the originals, but still there aren't a lot of original stories coming out. I also break down Holocaust films into four major categories because you can't compare uh, Marathon Man to The Pianist, even though they're both Holocaust films. So I break them down. First, if the protagonist was Jewish and he was a victim or she was a victim during the Holocaust, then it's a victim film uh, like The Pianist or Fateless uh, or The Counterfeiters uh, or Son of Saul. If, it's, if it takes place during the Holocaust and the protagonist is a Gentile or Gentiles, then it's a Gentile film Two thirds of the Gentile films are righteous Gentile films like Schindler's List or the, uh, or the Irina Sendler uh, story or The Zookeeper's Wife. And one third of the Gentile films are about non-righteous Gentiles uh, like Conspiracy uh, where uh, it, 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 uh, talk, it, it's about the Vonsey Conference. Then if it's after the Holocaust then it's about a, a Jewish victim of, of the Holocaust, and that's a survivor film, such as Harold and Maude or uh, X-Men. And if it's after the Holocaust and it's about a Nazi, then it's a perpetrator film like Marathon Man or The Boys from Brazil. And you can see the number of each of those films that, that were made uh, underneath. And then there's a tangential group for films that are clearly Holocaust films, but don't fit into these categories. And that includes Sophie's Choice, where Sophie's not Jewish, but clearly it's a Holocaust film. Or uh, a Cabaret, which uh, chronicles pre-war Germany, uh, or Inglorious Bastards. And now I'm gonna give you some samples, some examples of Holocaust films in each category. This is the Evelyn Wood part. So people ask me, how do I decide if a film is good or bad? What, is the, what are the criteria that I use? 
And I always start, whether it's a Holocaust film or not, is it a good story? Uh, if it's not a good story, then it doesn't matter how well it was acted or uh, costumed or the dialogue, the number of award, awards it's won, uh, how high uh, it is on ratings. If it's a bad story, it's not gonna work. And particularly in Holocaust film, if it's a story uh, that doesn't represent uh, the Jewish narrative or is historically inaccurate, then uh, it doesn't work for me. For example, The Boy in the Striped Pajamas is an absurd film about uh, two boys playing uh, adjacent to uh, high voltage wire with guards who would be watching and, and a Jewish little boy prisoner who, uh, well, if you've seen it, then, then you'll know why it's so absurd. And if you haven't, don't save yourself. Uh, or The Reader which uh, Kate Winslet got her Academy Award from it, but it, it's the story of a woman who is illiterate in 1950s East Germany, who uh, makes a deal with a 15 year old boy to have sex with him in order for him to read to her. And then we find out that this illiterate Nazi um, actually uh, locked 300 Jews in a barn and burnt it down. And she goes on trial and she can't defend herself because she's illiterate and we're supposed to feel sorry for her. So those are some of the, the things that I think about when I'm reviewing a, few, a film. And I'm going to give you an example of that here with a recent film that came out uh, last year. They tried to release it the year before. Uh, and it's a fabulous story about two Jews who escaped from Auschwitz and had documentation with them, which ultimately they brought to the Red Cross and, and convinced the Red Cross that the Red Cross had been duped all of those years at Theresienstadt and Auschwitz and other places. Uh, and it's a story that needed to be told. However, at the very beginning of the film, we see this. What you're seeing here is one of the escapees who makes it all the way, uh, being hung from the gate at Auschwitz with a sign on that says, hooray, welcome back, or hooray, I'm back. Uh, and this is shown right after the director's credit at the very beginning. And so throughout the entire film, we're waiting to see this man captured, this Jew captured, and, and hung, but it doesn't happen. And so uh, we're, we can't focus on the actual story that's being told because we're waiting for this capture, for this loose end. Also, not that it's important, but if you watch really carefully, you'll see the water going backwards up onto him. So they filmed this backwards. I'm not critical of that. I don't know why they did any of this, but it's just an interesting. And this is a list of some of the films that I highly recommend. I'll go back to that, I'm sorry. Here we go. Uh, that I highly recommend. Uh, and um, take you a second to look at it. In my book, uh, I list all of these, obviously. Um, so, uh, and in the book, uh, so you can see, uh, the ninth chapter is where I list uh, all of the 52 films that I recommend with capsule um, uh, reviews. Uh, and uh, there's also the eighth chapter, which is about Holocaust pedagogy, how to uh, choose Holocaust films and do the things you should do and shouldn't do. And uh, if you go to holocaustfilms.com, you can learn more about the book and about me and you can get in touch with me and I will be more than happy to uh, get back to you. So that's, uh, that's the overview, John. Great. Thank you so much, Rich. I hope uh, I wasn't on mute. 
<laughs> I would have told you about 90 seconds in to see if you would figure that out. You got you actually <laughs> did a video with sound and spoke at the same time. So kudos. Um, I, I want to just bring one thing up in, in your criteria that you didn't touch on. You have a very clear definition of the Holocaust. Um, could you share that? So we so when you talk about a Holocaust film, you have a definition for the word Holocaust. Right. So in the introduction of my book, uh, I, I don't I, I don't want there to be any questions. And so I will just read it to you. Uh, Notwithstanding or minimizing the suffering of any other victims at the hands of Germany's Nazi regime, including but not limited to political prisoners, mentally and physically disabled, partisans, Jehovah's Witnesses, Freemasons, homosexuals, Slavs, Romani, the non-Jewish clergy, prisoners of war, communists, and bystanders. In this book, the Holocaust is assumed to be an exclusively Jewish catastrophe. So uh, I, my definition and Yad Vashem's definition of the Holocaust is, the, is Jews. Uh, there's no, there are people who have tried to be more inclusive uh, but uh, to me, uh, I, as an example, the people who, who have pejoratively been termed gypsies have their own name for uh, what happened to them uh, at the hands of the Germans. Uh, and, and, and they can call it what they want and they can describe it as they want. Uh, it doesn't minimize their suffering, but um, a Holocaust is a Jewish experience. So I think to some degree, because I, I, I agree with you, I think it's impossible to discuss the Holocaust writ large without talking about the final solution, because the final solution was the attempted eradication of European Jewry. Um, and so when you talk about films you recommend, I think it's interesting that you recommend The Gray Zone, you recommend Conspiracy. You don't shy away from films that take us into that attempted destruction. Um, it, it, I wonder if, is, is that my interpretation of your work or does that, that jive with what, uh, how you present this? Well, I, um, I, I try to present the, the, the best films. And uh, some people have said that it appears that one of the things that I have done uh, in, in making my list includes movies that show Jews as uh, participants in resistance and um, obviously not in conspiracy because there were no Jews. But in the victim films, you, you find uh, there's been an observation that, that Jews who are active in resistance are important to me. But overall, uh, it, it's about the art. Um, and these are the most artful films. Uh, and uh, there are people who believe that other films such as Schindler's List uh, should be on that, but um, I'm, not, uh, I'm, I'm not an advocate of it. Sure, how do you, how do you then, because you, you mentioned you know, Schindler's List, which is the elephant in the room of every Holocaust discussion. You also mentioned the Holocaust miniseries. Anybody coming up of my age, I'm 54, Watching the Holocaust miniseries for me was transformative, as it was for uh, the, the, the country of Germany. How do you define the, the quality of a film versus the impact of a film? Well, the impact is, is, is incontrovertible. Uh, two, two, one out of every two Americans watched the Holocaust miniseries. It was responsible for uh, Jimmy Carter establishing the United States Holocaust Commission, which was responsible for the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, but anybody who, who goes back and even just watches the trailer will be uh, aghast at how poorly it was made and, and how unrealistic it looks and how the Jews don't look like Jews and, and, and how plastic it is, which was Elie Wiesel's, part of Elie Wiesel's criticism of it when he wrote about it, it in the New York Times upon its release. Uh, Schindler's List is, is a different matter. Uh, I have great respect for Steven Spielberg. He's a great man and he's never embarrassed the Jewish people. Uh, and, he, and he gave all the profits of, the, uh, of Schindler's List to, to create the Shoah Foundation. He's, he, that, that, 
is irrelevant though when, when judging a film. And my criticisms of Schindler's List are uh, first that uh, he's taken uh, a film three and a quarter hours to tell a one hour, one and a half hour story. Uh, and the story that he tells is about a German, a Nazi who saves Jews from Germans, which is in the words of Stanley Kubrick, um, the Holocaust was uh, about 6 million Jews being killed, not by, not about uh, a, a few hundred Jews being saved by um, a Nazi. Um, so I, 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 yes, there, there are a dozen righteous Gentile films uh, about people who saved more Jews than Oscar Schindler did, um, but they didn't have the um, uh, they didn't have the advantage of of having a book read by Steven Spielberg, and they didn't have the advantage of being Nazis. And so, if you can, uh, the greatest redemption story you can tell is 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 of a, of a Nazi who uh, participated in the destruction of European Jewry without blinking an eye for the first five and a half million Jews and then grew a conscience. Uh, I also object uh, to his shower fake out scene, which couldn't have happened. Uh, I, I, uh, I think it's a scare scene, like throwing Indiana Jones into a, sna a, a, pit, a, sna a pit of snakes. Um, it implies that the Jews knew, which they didn't, even if one or two Jews did know it spreads throughout the entire thing magically. And that's not what the shower looked like. And I object to the uh, scene at the end that implies that um, Israel is a, is, a, is a direct byproduct of the Holocaust. Uh, and that's not Israel's narrative. It's not the Jewish narrative, but People who walk away from Schindler's List believe it is the Holocaust narrative. Thank you. So th this brings up a couple of things. And before we get to the question, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we've had some people that have requested um, a copy of the slides with the names of films on them. Is that something we can make available after? Or should I say, hey, buy the book, read the whole thing. Don't just... <laughs> I'll let Moniz worry about that. I don't want to... I don't... <laughs> Uh, try to make stuff available. But again, I, I really do. Anybody with a library of Holocaust literature, this is an important book, just like you have to have the Gilbert maps. You know, this, this, is, this is something you should be adding. Um, we just talked about, uh, you talked about honesty, you talked about education. This is interesting, because you talk about Boy with the Striped Pajamas, which, which I find is a very dangerous movie, because it's incredibly emotionally manipulative. And it uses the, the, the most horrific event possible, the Holocaust, to play with those emotions. So my question to you is, we have viewers that don't know the history. And if they see a film like Boy in Pajamas, they're like, oh my God, there, there was pain and suffering on both sides. How do we get the education across so the people know that I can see Boy in the Striped Pajamas and call out the nonsense, or I can see life is beautiful and find the moments that resonate, but still understand the, the, the fabulization of it. How do we balance that? Well, the Boy in the Striped Pajamas is, is, is incredibly dangerous, but it's, it's dangerous in the same way that life is beautiful is. That you, if you don't know better than you think that uh, a little boy could waltz around in Auschwitz like Opie and Mayberry and, and have fun with his dad. And um, it, th there, as opposed to Inglorious Bastards, which I advocate, uh, it's not, they're not farces. So you walk, if you walk out of a Tarantino movie believing anything that you saw, then that's on you. I mean, you're the fool. If you walk out of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and think that Sharon Tate survived, then uh, that's on you. But you could walk out of these, of the Boy in the Striped Pajamas and, and, and Life is Beautiful and think, oh, it wasn't so bad. They could just pass 
they could just pass uh, food in between barbed wire, electrified barbed wire. So uh, it, we, we have a responsibility as viewers to understand what we're seeing. And obviously the people who are making the films are gonna make whatever they, whatever sells. So that's not their responsibility, it's our responsibility. So then I guess, I guess the follow up question to this is for people who work in the field, we're trying to educate, we're trying to educate future generations. We, no one has to talk about rise in anti-Semitism. No one has to talk about rise in hate crimes across, across the map. How do we use Holocaust cinema then? And you're very specific with this in your book. How do we use Holocaust narrative, which has liberty to suspend disbelief on occasion? How do we use the narrative to, to get into the schools and to change the mindsets, build empathy? Okay, so uh, the underlying premise of, of, of my work is that Holocaust cinema is a supplement to education. And uh, so if you have a lesson plan that is about the, uh, the, the French roundup uh, in Paris, Le Raff, then there are films about that. If you wanna learn about the Vance conference, then there are reenactments of that. If you wanna learn about what happened in Auschwitz uh, or in Hungary or in Italy uh, or just after liberation, then there are films that show these things. But you can't teach the Holocaust with a film. And you can't teach these subjects without, with a film without the background. The example that, that I would give, which is not in Holocaust cinema, but generally is many of us have seen many, the miniseries Ozark. But even if you watch three or four seasons of Ozark, you have no idea why that part of Missouri or that part of the world got that way. What, what, is it, what have you learned after four seasons of that about the underlying place? Nothing. You've learned a lot about Jason Bateman's family, but so what? And the same is true of Deadwood. Why was Deadwood, which was a miniseries, why was, Dead, why was this happening in Deadwood? There are very important lessons about it and about treaties with, the, with, with Native Americans and, and cowboys and settling. You don't learn any of that. Or if you do, you're so caught up in the story that you can't, that the, that the history goes past you. So as an educator, your job is to find the right film. And, and I list in my book uh, about 80 different topics uh, that you might want to be teaching and the films that, that, are, that we, would be useful for those topics. Uh, so uh, I put a lot of the responsibility on the educators and on the parents to find the right films. Yeah, and I guess this is my, my shameless plug for my field of work, which is documentary. I believe that documentaries go, you know, hand in hand in glove with, with narrative and with other, with other sources of, of information, because I think a documentary, you go into a documentary knowing that, they're, that this is honest. You go into a feature saying this is based on truth or this is a true story. And I think marrying the two with the educational stuff, things you're talking about with the curriculum guides that teachers have, we have to keep working on this. I think we're up to 14 states with mandated Holocaust education out of 50. It's a laughable number. But um, well, it's, it's, not, it's not a shameless plug. You do wonderful work and, and, and it's important work and it's work that needs to be done. But the reality is, is that uh, people go to narrative films much more than they go to documentaries. And uh, just as Elie Wiesel was, said that, that he, would, he would prefer that people read the original texts and see the real thing, that's not the world that we live in. But in a perfect world, your films would be what people would see and The Boy in the Striped Pajamas would be on the cutting room floor. But unfortunately, we don't live in that world. But it's true. And, it's true. and your work is remarkable. Your, I mean, your particular work. I'll say that, um, like Elie Wiesel, I had the, the good fortune to lecture with Elie Wiesel a few times. And his line that I always loved was, all my other books are jealous of night. You know, he had one, one that was elevated to such, but yet he knows that all the other works had value as well. But you're right. We see the Schindler's list. We see the films that, that get that spotlight. And that becomes part of our conscience. That's so funny because when I talked to Jerry Garcia, he said all of my other songs are, are jealous of trucking. And 
I just, I, I, I now I know where Jerry got it. It's he, he, he but if, if the next question that came in, and I, this is something that I think is important, and you, you, we, we've danced around this a little bit. I personally like films that focus on the Holocaust, focus on the victims, focus on the survivors. I like films that, that go in. I'm not scared of that. Yet we see a lot of films that tap dance around it. I call it Holocaust adjacent. People who do, so it's a film about Mengele, a film about Nazis, a film about this. What are the challenges do you think of making films? And this is what comes from one of our viewers. What are the challenges of making films that are really inside the Holocaust versus those tangential pieces? Well, um, I, I think that the, 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 the example, that, that the greatest example of that is The Book Thief, where people believe it's about the Holocaust, but there's almost no Holocaust content in it. Um, I, don't, I, I, I don't fault a film for that. The Book Thief stands on its own as a film. I'm, I don't recommend it, but, but I don't say it's a bad film because it didn't get deeper into the Holocaust. Uh, I would just say that um, some films need to, need to be there, like Valkyrie didn't need to be there. And, and um, they're, they're, not all films have to be Holocaust films, but if they're gonna be Holocaust films, then they can't mis misrepresent the Holocaust. That's what I would say. We had somebody, it's interesting too. What I, again, I said this in the introduction. I like the fact that you, you put words on things, you put names on things, uh, you put criteria. You choose to use the word Holocaust. There are many other words to represent, whether we use Shoah, whether we use Yiddish interpretation. You choose, is there a reason why you choose to use the word Holocaust to define uh, this, this era, this chapter, this event? I, I try to I, I try to be um, accessible, and uh, I don't need to. I know that there's some people who take words and pronounce them in a certain way or do things in a certain way because that's the going hip way. Uh, I grew up with the word Holocaust. I live in Israel where the word is Shoah, but that's not what is most uh, the most accessible word for it. And I don't think I need to lecture anybody uh, just by using definite the, the word to, I don't need that. And um, it's, uh, but I did, uh, when, I, when I was writing the book, I used the, the, the word anti-Semitism spelled the way I grew up with it, which was little A-N-T-I hyphen capital S. And so many people said, that's not the way we do it anymore. That's just not the way. It's one word. And there are reasons for it. And it wasn't a battle worth fighting. So I said, fine, I'll, I'll spell it that way. It, 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 it's not. So I guess it's a pick your battles kind of thing. Shoah or Holocaust are fine. And anti-Semitism with or without a hyphen, it, it's not my battle. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it is true. It, it, I, I've always thought it was interesting how how we put names to things that, you know, as you were in as you were inside Auschwitz, you don't I mean, you might not know the name of where you are at first. You may not know the name to how we described where we are. You were in the camps, you were in the logger, you were that, that we, we brought names into things. Names come later. Sometimes the experience is what matters and how we capture the experience. There's OK. Somebody mentioned um, Son of Saw. Do you have I, do you have Son of Saul on both on, on, on the victims list? Where do you where do you place Son of Saul? Oh, it's a victim film. Yeah. It's definitely a victim film. But Son of Saul, I recommend in my book because uh, it's a great representation of Birkenau. But uh, I'm very critical of Son of Saul. Very. Um, perhaps I'm more critical of Son of Saul than any other film that I recommend. Uh, I'm critical of it because it was uh, it was a knockoff and uh, of, of the Gray Zone, which is the greatest Holocaust film ever made, um, and it and and it was unapologetic. They, they didn't they, they didn't cite Tim Blake Nelson or, or the Gray Zone uh, when they knocked it off, um, and he was called out. The director was called out for it at the Cannes Film Festival, and his answer was, "Yeah, but mine's an Hungarian." It makes a difference. And, uh, and also it's almost impossible to watch because you're just sitting there going, 
I, I like I'm I, I'm in his kishkas. I'm right there. I'm like I I cannot I, I don't even know what I'm seeing. I'm reacting to every little thing, and um, it's it, it it's an intense experience. Uh, that I mean, it is a bold movie because it's like it's like they threw away every lens you know wider than a 50. <laughs> and make your talk so everything is here you're intentionally behind you're intentionally blurring out the depth it's a it is the the the, the narrowness i mean it the the, the but, yeah but but all of that aside it's a story about a crazy jew who is trying to get other jews to stop the resistance so that he can say a prayer for somebody who he, he, he is taken on as his son, who's not his son. You don't see in any Holocaust, in any victim film, crazy Jews as protagonists. We can't afford it. I mean, there, there, were, there just wasn't that kind of room for, for, for Mishikas. And so he, just, as a, just plot wise, he doesn't need he, he, he's, he's he, like he can't find a rabbi who will say Kaddish. He can't find one. He didn't need a rabbi to say Kaddish. He any every single person there knew how to say Kaddish. He could have gotten a minion at any time, but he's just. It, it doesn't make sense to me, but it's a great representation of Birkenau. Exactly, but as you say, yeah, they did. It was, it was, it was a terrific representation of, of the, the the inner, the, the the ultimate inner evil of of that place for sure. Um, people are some people are asking about you know where does material come from, uh, whether it comes from interviews, whether it comes from books. Somebody mentioned the Devil's Arithmetic based on a based on a book. Are there any adaptations from books to film that you feel are most most worthy of our time? I have to say, uh, and if I were somebody else, I would feel ashamed, but I, I'm not going to, that that books are not my, I feel like Chauncey Gardner. <laughs> I like to watch. Uh, I, I don't know the, I, I, like I haven't read the book Thief and I haven't read uh, The Devil's Arithmetic and I haven't read Schindler's Ark and I haven't read The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Uh, I, I no, I mean I I I don't. It's not my it's not my world, um, and I, I, my formative experience with this. I, I mean I've read a billion books. Don't get me wrong, but I don't read the underlying books to movies. And my formative experience of this was uh, the 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 Robin Williams first movie, The World According to Garp which I love, which is a great film. If you're a Robin Williams fan, you got to see it, or Glenn Close fan, or John Lithgow, uh, Amanda Plummer. It's a great film. And uh, the people who read the John Irving book hate the film. And the people who saw, who read it first, that is, if you read the book first, you hate the film. If you And if you saw the film first, you hate the book. Which, when I was a kid, and, and I was noticing that in conversations with people, it was it was more instructive to me than 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 any cinema class I could have taken, just about how how people's opinions are formed uh, in this. But uh, a, a great film that that was made a few years ago is called Phoenix. It was uh, a remake. It, it was a German film. It was a remake of of a film made many years ago called Out of the Ashes, which was uh, from a memoir of somebody else. Uh, they're, the sources of these things are, are wide. And, and, and I would also say that the greatest Anne Frank movies have, have very little to do with her book and, and weren't even sanctioned by the Anne Frank Foundation. Uh, so the underlying material, uh, I, and, but I should also say that the gray zone was, was, was almost completely taken uh, from uh, the diaries of of the survivor uh, of the victims of the Sando Commando and uh, the doctor. So there's no one rule for it. I just know that for me, it, it's it it's superfluous information reading the book first because I'm just saying maybe they should have included this, maybe they shouldn't, but it doesn't matter because what's on the screen is the only thing I can judge. Yeah. 
I, th I think it was found interesting that, that um, the gray zone premiered as a play. I thought that was uh, the Tim Blake Nelson talks about the performing live performance of the gray zone prior to filming. And it, it does have that feel. Like I look at it as a filmmaker, it does have a theatrical feel to the characters, how they're interacting. Uh, it, it, anyway, I'm, I'm just, maybe I'm getting too deep inside on film stuff, but it was interesting seeing where things come from, that where they workshop, where, where they build their dialogue and the connections and the emotional moments. They come from everywhere, and that's part of the process of filmmaking in the free market system. So uh, when, when films aren't subsidized and they have to get money from producers, then, every, then there are a million, as you know, then there are a million uh, opinions that you have to consider. And it's, a, it's an amazing uh, exercise in in the cream rising to the top it doesn't it, it doesn't always happen but as opposed to a system like i i i say in my book and uh i always get <laughs> very interesting reactions that when i break down films by um nationality who who did the best and who did the worst in holocaust film production that the um uh, Czechoslovakians and Hungarians have made the best, but one country has made the worst. Of uh, have made a dozen horrible, horrible films. Not one great film has been made, which has been produced and directed by people of this nationality. And I'm not going to say the name of the country, but it shares a really long border with the United States. And I can say that in that country the films are subsidized. And so you don't have to uh, have the same uh, amount, the, the, the working through the stories to get to uh, what should be on the screen because they, they have the money in hand. Uh, and we're talking about films that were made by Norman Jewison with Michael Caine and Susan Sarandon and uh, and 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 Louise Fletcher and Rod Steiger and it, 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 it and Christopher Plummer and they're just un, unwatchable except as 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 examples of how not to make a Holocaust film. But I'm not going to say the name of the country. Although there was a region in Birkenau that bears the same name, which is yes, worth, yes. Although sometimes it's felt but still. I'm not, the, I, and I love people from that country. Do you see, do you, so, so I'll go back to, to the 50s. When, when, I, when I do my lectures, I talk about Holocaust cinema in America. And I, I reference Anne Frank in 59, Holocaust miniseries and Schindler's List, because the lecture is 10 years old. And I look at what was happening in Europe at the time, Alain Rene, uh, Andre Waja, uh, Waja with Canal versus Anne Frank, which is fluffy in 59. Do you, so I, I will say in the 50s and 60s, Europe embraced the Holocaust, I think, more genuinely than America. Do you feel that we're caught up? Do you feel there's a distinction now between European approach to Holocaust and American approach to Holocaust in film? I don't think that the Europeans can afford to waste crappy Holocaust films. I mean, they, 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 most of their films are not bad. Uh, and uh, they're, they're not horrible. Uh, Finzi Contini, you know, and there are a million great, the shop on Main Street, and uh, these were early ones, and, and um, uh, there are so many great European films. Um, they were there, they had access to it uh, to start with. Uh, the information was better there, but also the, the Diary of Anne Frank in 1959, that's, a, that's an example. The, the, the filmmakers deliberately anodized it and that they, they wanted it to be sterile. They, the, the, the Goodrich and Hackett script that was used in a dozen movies, the same thing. Uh, I have a reel that I can show you of the same scene of, of, of that you see in the first one of Shelley Winters getting uh, milk spilled on her fur coat this in, in each of the films. If that's the highlight of your film, then you're in trouble. And, uh, and, and so they, the, 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 there's a decision made uh, early on in America that the films were, were not going to be, uh, couldn't be 
uh, with the exception again of uh, uh, of the pawnbroker, where. But there you're talking about Sidney Lumet, one of the most courageous, maybe the most courageous filmmaker ever, ever to sit behind a camera. And he said, this is going to be the way it is. And I know it's early and I can't show everything that I want to show, but I'm going to show uh, what's needed here. Uh, and so I think that, that you juxtapose those two films uh, that were made within six years of each other. And you really, it's a great study in, in, in courage, Lumet's courage. I, I, I should, I, 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 I also want to talk about uh, Hal Ashby, the great Hal Ashby, who made Harold and Maude. And who, who again, with Lumet, uh, is one of the great filmmakers ever. He made what I consider to be the greatest film of any kind ever made, which is being there. Uh, and uh, I encourage everybody to see Being There, uh, which is was Peter Sellers' last movie, and Shirley MacLaine and, and Melvin Douglas, and uh, it, it is so great. Uh, but he made this movie, Harold and Maude, uh, about a Holocaust survivor, and even though uh, you only see for a third of a second, uh, toward the end of it, her tattoo, the entire thing is framed with her being a survivor and you don't even know that it's happening. She's talking about when she was a kid in Vienna and, uh, and how much she misses that and her husband. And then she tears up and she says that was all before. And the only reason that you don't know that she's talking about before the Holocaust is because the kid, Harold, has no idea what to say. He doesn't say before what. And, and right after the, 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 her, her tattoo is revealed, right at that exact moment, she starts to talk about Alfred Dreyfus. And, and, I, I, and she lives in a train car. And uh, so many people have, a, have, have uh, object to the idea that Harold and Maude is a Jewish, is a, Jew, is a, is a survivor film. It's as much of a survivor film as X-Men, which his entire character, Magneto's character is framed. And he never talks about it again. He spent three minutes at the beginning in the gates of Auschwitz. And, and then it becomes an analog. The, these mutants become an analog to the Jews. And you don't need, he didn't need to hit anybody over the head with it. So we're, we're getting near the end of our time, but I have room for a couple more things. I want to, people are asking about uh, films dealing with resistance. And I think this is an important topic. I know you mentioned Defiance is one film that, that, that you approve of <laughs> that gets the two thumbs up. In my opinion, I find that people are more likely to embrace a Holocaust film that is more tangential or that shows Jews fighting back. We want to see not Jews as victims or suffering. We want to see it fighting back. Glorious Bastards, even though it's a fable. What do you see in terms of resistance films or those examples of Jewish resistance? Well, I barely give Defiance two thumbs up. Uh, do, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I only give it, a, a, I only recommend the film because it is such an outrageous act of, of, of defiance. And uh, I, I'm critical of the acting. I'm critical of the dialogue. Uh, oh, Tuvia, you are the world to us. It's, I, I, and, and, and at the end where Lev Shriver and Daniel Craig are dodging 10,000 bullets and, and suddenly drop a grenade into a tank and the entire battlefield goes quiet. I, I'm, I'm, I don't, um, I, but, but I, I think that the gray zone is about resistance. It, it, it's it, it's about the the destruction of of, of the gas chambers. I, I I'm I, I'm not a big fan of of, of uprising. Uh, I think that David Schwimmer's accent is so distracting. Uh, the, the really when you watch uh, uprising, the best part of it is John Voigt. He he uh, he plays this German general, uh, and and he's he's so good at it. Uh, John Voigt, who also was in the Odessa file, which is a, a, a very good Holocaust film, a, a good uh, perpetrator genre film. Uh, so yeah, resistance matters, but but also in in the counterfeiters, 
It's a form of resistance. These guys, their job in this camp is to make uh, fake money for the German war effort. And they do everything that they can to sabotage it without getting killed. Mm -hmm. uh, and fateless is, is, is about passive resistance. How is this kid going to make it through? Uh, and, uh, but I don't think, and, and I, and I, I love the pianist, but I don't think it's about resistance. It's just passive. He just passively makes it through. Yeah. So resistance matters within a, a, up to a point. It's not everything, but it's important. So we're, we're, like I said, I'm going to just plow through a couple of questions here, just so we have them. People are asking about, I'll take as many as you want. Well, I'll be worried about Monisa's time. The time oh, okay. So the idea of um, uh, a documentary to recommend, I recommend something that sort of marries the two, the two fields, which is Imaginary Witness, which is a history of Holocaust film uh, as a documentary. I think you watch that and then you figure out the topic that you wanna learn from, like, like, uh, like Rich is saying, if you wanna learn about the Warsaw Uprising, you can watch film, you can watch Claude Lanzmann's Shoah, where they interview some of the, 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 the resistance fighters. You can, you can find your specific need. But I think Imaginary Witness is a worthwhile film that sort of bridges the fields. Are, are you a fan of that film or what's your what's your opinion? Oh, I love Imaginary Witness. It, 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 it had a huge impact on on me uh, as a, as a, an educator. And uh, and I've quoted from it. Oh, it's a it's a wonderful film. I uh, another one that's really interesting is um, called. Um, Oh, I forget the name of it. I'm, I'm going to look look up here for you. Um, well, you're thinking, I will, I will answer. This is an interesting question that came in while you're finding that. Someone asked if there's a moral conflict in making films or docs that allow you to earn a living from other people's suffering. Um, it's an interesting question. And I'll say as a filmmaker who works in documentary, I was in the beginning when I would talk to survivors, I always felt like I was bothering them, that I was asking questions that were too deep that I was going to bring up trauma for them. And it wasn't until I did my first film where I realized I was insulting them by not going deeply enough, by not asking the real questions. Um, I'd say 99% of the survivors I deal with appreciate the fact that people are doing work to keep these stories alive, to make sure that we do not experience another Holocaust in any of our lifetimes. So I think as far as making a living, I, I wish, I think all of us do other stuff and we do this because we we believe so much in the message. I, and the value. I haven't made a living doing this yet, yeah. but, but I, I don't, I don't think that I, I think to, to, to suggest that people who are involved in Holocaust education are exploitative or exploiting the Holocaust is, is like suggesting that an oncologist is, I, I don't, I, I don't understand the premise of it. Uh, I know that I know that Norm, Norman that, that that what's his I'm not even going to say his name that there's a phrase there's no business like Shoah business. Uh, okay, uh, I mean I, I don't think that there are a lot of millionaires that are that that are being minted from the Holocaust. You brought this up too. There is a cynicism. Oh, if you want to win an Academy Award, you know, make a make a Holocaust film. You're right. There's a higher percentage likelihood of recognition, but it doesn't work that way. It's just not. Well, that I, 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 there's math. There, there's math to support the numbers. Yeah, but that that uh, I don't think that's a matter of, of of Holocaust education. I don't. I, I do believe that that was uh, that Steven Spielberg uh, was partially motivated because he had never won Best Director, and he did get it. Uh, I. I, I, I I don't think that anybody who who is objective would who knows this history would say that that wasn't part of his motivation, but I would say it was about two percent, and I would say that ninety eight percent of it was to make the best Holocaust film he could. Um, the documentaries that I like, there's one called Inheritance from two thousand six, which is about a woman uh, who saw. Schindler's List, and then realized that her father was uh, was the commandant uh, in Plaschau, uh, who, who Ralph Fiennes played, uh, and um, and then goes back to the camp to ask to, for forgiveness from one of the um, one of his victims. Another one, um, there are two that that are based on um, film that 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 
was recently discovered. One is called A uh, Film Unfinished from 2010. Another one is called A Night Will Fall from 2014. And a, a guy named uh, Ashton Glickman made, a, a kid really, made one called We Shall Not Die Now uh, from 2019. That I like, and your films. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, of course, recommend yours. Well, it's, it's, it's implicit in our conversation. Yes. Uh, and actually, somebody did ask that. If, if anybody's interested in seeing two of the films I've done about Holocaust, the first one is called Swimming in Auschwitz which is a study of six women focuses on spiritual resistance within the camps. The second film is called After Auschwitz, Same Six Women, and it picks up with You're Free, Go Home, which was for many Holocaust survivors, the second worst day of their lives. The worst day being when they were take, put in the camps, taken from their families. So- But also, you, but, but also just to know that your quality is there, but an adjacent one called Pizza in Auschwitz was made yes there's a there's a there's a film called pizza in auschwitz about a family uh, survivors that go back to birkenau and they're hungry <laughs> and they actually order out pizza while they're there and eat it in the barracks so uh, your work your your work is the gray zone and here we have the boy in the striped pajamas going. Uh, I was filming a different project and we spent a day filming in Auschwitz. We were at the main camp and the staff parking lot is directly adjacent to crematorial one. Like literally there's like four foot high shrubs and then yeah. and it's lunchtime and they start setting up food in the parking lot. And I was like, no, do you see what's there? It's 50 feet away, not even. I'm like, no. Yeah, but, but, but there's a, but, but there's a, where they are. Yeah, and, 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 and the pizza that they sell at, at Auschwitz is in kosher, uh, which is really, I'm not kidding. And, 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 at, and, at, uh, and in Birkenau, I, I took pictures, you can see. If you go to if you if you if you go to my website holocaustfilms.com, you can see an article I wrote called "My Trip to Poland," where I took a picture of matching refrigerator magnets, Auschwitz Birkenau, that that are sold in the gift shop. So, uh, you know, the the world is 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 a funny place that somebody would have thought that that, that was a good idea. And and eating somebody, you have to eat somewhere. I think that. I think that parking lot is further away than the actual kiosk where you can get the food. The staff lot in, in, in Auschwitz one, not-, not Yeah, Auschwitz. you're eating, you're always eating there. Yeah, yeah. So, here, so so let's let's wrap it up here and then I'll, I'll introduce Liz to, to bring us home. Um, look into your crystal ball. Where are we going with Holocaust cinema in the future? Uh, I think that one or two good films are going to be made uh, every few years. And uh, I, 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 I see the films that are coming out now, like there was a, a film with Jesse Eisenberg a couple a, a year ago uh, that, where he reprised, where he, he did Marcel Marceau's um, story as a, resi as a Jewish uh, resistance fighter in, 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 from Strasbourg. Uh, it was a, a, a crappy movie uh, with a, a big staff, a, a, a big cast. Uh, I look at Ari Fullman's latest film um, called Where is Anne Frank, which Ari Fullman, who made one of the greatest perpetrator films of all time called Made in Israel, a fantastic film, a absolutely wickedly wonderful film. Um, but this, his latest film, um, where is, uh, where is Anne Frank is an animated film about the spirit of Anne Frank's diary breaking out of the case in, in, in the Anne Frank house and becoming a real person and then going out into the real world, taking the diary with her and then making out with a pickpocket and then ultimately being on the roof with a bunch of refugees and threatening uh, all of the police and everybody below that she's going to burn the diary if the refugees aren't allowed to settle in the Netherlands. It's so I, I see a lot 
of uh, there are going to be a lot of bad films and every once in a while you'll see a gem like 1945 or Phoenix or my daughter Anne Frank. Uh, it, it's going to be the same thing. Great. Thank you so much, Rich. And I, I want to bring in um, Liz from uh, March of the Living who will give us our final words. But I also want to, I mean, I'm going to say it again to people. If you still don't want to buy this book, buy it anyway. And then Rich and I will kick in and refund your money if you don't like it. I'm telling you, if you are passionate about this material, this, this is, this is a, a piece of work that you need as part of your library. I feel like I'm on QVC, but I'm telling you, it is, it is not just... It is a reference piece, but it also, it also hold, has hold it up, John. Hold it up while you're doing it. <laughs> so, 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 please, if if, uh, if you do keep that library, I do recommend this. Um, so, Rich, thanks so much, and and thank you, March of Living, for inviting me. And Liz, the microphone is yours. Thank you, thank you so much, Rich, for this really fascinating lecture, and John for facilitating. So brilliantly. I'm sitting here, you know, ferociously writing notes about films that I now need to watch. Um, and, and, and I know that a lot of people here have been very engaged in the, in the questions and you've really kept everyone's attention and, and they keep having questions coming. So thank you so much. I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say thank you for sharing your knowledge with us, with us and opening our eyes to this always fascinating topic. Um, to hear more about further educational webinars offered by International March of the Living, please visit our website, MOTL.org, and follow us on our various social media platforms. Please also stay tuned for more information about our return to Poland and Israel for the 2022 March of the Living coming up in April. We look forward to greeting all of you at our next event in the near future. Stay safe and shalom. Thank you.